So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Sterling. I'm provost here at Imperial College, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome our speaker this evening, global food expert and distinguished member of our Centre for Environmental Policy, Professor Sir Gordon Conway, who will be giving the 28th annual Schrodinger Lecture. I'm delighted to welcome so many of you here to college this evening, and a particularly warm welcome to those of you visiting us um, for the first time. We are especially pleased to welcome Erwin Schrodinger's grandson and granddaughter, my colleague, Professor Terry Rudolph, from our Department of Physics here, and his sister, Pamela. We're delighted that they can join us here uh, this evening. The Schrodinger Lecture is one of the most important uh, events in the college calendar. It is, of course, named after the distinguished Austrian theoretical physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics and quantum theory. Schrodinger was co-recipient of the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1933, and his work continues to have a profound impact and indeed inspires much of the theoretical and experimental research that we do at Imperial today. Though not, I should hasten to add, any experimental research involving cats. The Schrodinger Lecture is Imperial's own small tribute to his work, and in many ways, a series of distinguished lectures is a fitting tribute to a man who famously said that, quote, if you cannot, in the long run, tell everyone what you have been doing, your doing has been worthless. Previous speakers at the Schrodinger Lecture include a number of Nobel Prize winners in recent times, uh, Paul Nurse, Serge Haroche, and Elizabeth Blackburn. And our talk this evening continues the proud tradition of the Schrodinger Lecture. The topic is, of course, a vitally important one, addressing one of the great global challenges uh, that faces society, the urgent need for a solution to malnutrition and world hunger. The statistics around these are shocking. One in nine people don't have enough food to lead a healthy, active life, and poor nutrition kills more than three million children every year and stokes, stunts the growth of one in four. Add in climate change and population growth and the problem can only become more acute. We need to act now. We need sustainable and productive agriculture that does not damage the environmental resources on which it depends. This is indeed a global challenge in the true sense of the word, exactly the type of challenge that we here at Imperial College have committed uh, to tackling in our recently published college strategy which will guide us for the next five years. There are few people better placed to inform and challenge us on this topic than our speaker this evening. Professor Sir Gordon Conway is one of the world's foremost experts on global food needs and a pioneer of sustainable agriculture since the 1960s. He joined us here at Imperial in 1970, setting up the Center for Environmental Technology in 1976. He has lived and worked extensively in Asia and the Middle East, and he currently leads the Agriculture for Impact program, advocating for more European government support for agricultural development in sub-Saharan Africa. Amongst other positions of influence he has held, one can mention Chief Scientific Advisor to DFID and serving as President of the Royal Geographical Society. In his lecture, Sir Gordon will describe the challenges we face and the tools we need to overcome them. Now, before I hand over, I'd like to remind you that all of you that we have a, a drinks reception immediately after the lecture in, in, in the reception area on the ground floor where you will have the opportunity not just to have some refreshments, but also to meet some of our own agricultural science researchers and find out what they do. 
For now, though, I would like to invite you all to join me in giving our speaker this evening, Professor Sir Gordon Conway, a very warm welcome to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Provost, and it's a delight to be here this evening, and I'm particularly pleased that members of the Schrodinger family are here, and also Schrodinger students, I've met several of them uh, just now. Uh, as was mentioned, I set up the Centre for Environmental Technology, as it was then called in 1976, and so we're now celebrating our 40th year, and we keep going from strength to strength, we take 150 master's students a year, and any of you who are at the undergraduate level and want to do a master's, I recommend you apply. Um, I want to start out with a story. My wife, Susan, who's here, and I started our married life in Borneo. It was, in many ways, an idyllic place something of a paradise. This was the view from our veranda of Mount Kinabala. I expect some of you have actually been there and climbed the mountain. But like all paradises, it had some flaws. And when I got there, the director of agriculture said to me, go down to the southeast of the country, to the Indonesian border. We're trying to grow cocoa there. We're growing cocoa under the primary forest, under secondary forest trees. But when you go there, you'll see it's in a bit of a bad way. Well, you can see. It had no leaves on it, and many of the trees were dying. So I first of all decided I would need to find out what these pests were. And uh, they were pretty bad pests. This one here, the ringbark borer, would burrow around the tree, make a complete girdle around the tree, which of course kills it. And then there was another one called a bagworm up at the top there, which used to eat the leaves, would not only eat the leaves, it would cut the leaves and make itself a nice little bag in which it would live. And I started talking to the planters there. There were Chinese and English and Filipino and Indonesian planters there. And I said, uh, this is terrible. What are you doing? They said, oh, we're doing a great job, they said. We spray twice a week with a mixture of DDT, BHC, Dieldrin, and Endrin. We're really going to get on top of this. And I, you know, I thought, I don't think this is the right thing to do. I think this is probably making it all worse. I think there are probably natural enemies out there of the pests in the secondary forest. And maybe we should stop spraying. So I said to them, I think you should stop spraying. And they said, come on. You know, you're 22 years old and you only just graduated from university. You don't know anything about anything. And fortunately, my director came to visit me to see what was going on and I told him and he said, I think you're right. And so he decreed that all spraying would stop. And within a few months, the parasites, and you can see some parasitic wasps at the bottom here, all appeared. And the pest disappeared, except for one, the bagworm, which was still a bit resistant, and we had to use a, a bacillus uh, in insecticide to get rid of it. But within a year, there were no pests on the cocoa, and it stayed like that for 30 more years. It was one of the first examples of what's called integrated pest management, uh, probably the first in the tropics. And as that is one of the ingredients of sustainable agriculture. But the question is, where are we now? This is where we are now. I always show this slide at the beginning of a lecture. Because these are all the crises that we face. I've just added one more crisis on there this morning. And whenever I show it, I always think to myself, these crises are getting worse. And they're getting more and more interconnected. They're heading, as it were, for a perfect storm, in John Bennington's words. What is particularly worrying is it's not clear who's in charge 
of all of this? Whose responsibility is all of this? We now have the new Sustainable Development Goals, which do deal with many of these issues. I suppose, in theory, it's the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. But I'm not sure that they really are up to being in charge of dealing with this. And that, in a way, is the biggest challenge we face. Hunger is, of course, manifest particularly in Africa and in India. We've got about 800 million people who are chronically hungry in the world. And we've got global warming. I want to continue talking about the threats before I come on to the solutions. I don't know whether there's anybody left in this audience who doesn't believe that global warming is happening, but that's a very, very telling graph. It's true that last year was the hottest year on record, and it's true that last year was an El Nino year. And you'll see the red are all El Nino years. The El Nino years are particularly hot, but they're getting hotter, and that's what's happening there. Just in case ah, you're not clear about El Nino, that's one that hasn't worked across. But effectively what happens is that the, um, uh, the, the, the Pacific waters uh, in an El Nino year run from the west to the east. They land in Peru about Christmas time, which is why it's called El Nino, the boy child, Jesus Christ. And that produces heat all around the world. And it has effects everywhere. So for example, southern Africa at the moment has got a major drought which comes about from El Nino. It's a natural phenomenon, but it's getting worse in its effects. On the left is what a two degree above pre-industrial world would look like. On the right is what a four degree above pre-industrial will look like. Despite what happened at COP, we're heading roughly to about three, three to four degrees above pre-industrial. If you get to that, you can see on the right there, in Africa, those very dark red purple colours, that's where temperatures are four, five degrees or more in Africa. That's where we're going. And this graph, which is quite interesting, it measures where countries are moving from, countries and the sea in particular, are moving from the historical record into something which is beyond the historical record. And this shows those places on the planet which will be beyond the historical record by 2020. And you can see, in particular, down the west coast there, that uh, red. And of course, we know that that's happening in Britain. December was the wettest, hottest month since records began. These uh, daffodils on the right are in the hedgerow near our house at the beginning of December. They're sort of over now. We know that in the um, southeast of Britain, it's going to get hotter and drier. And in the rest of the country, it's going to get wetter. In the southeast of England, we're going to cope with this by covering the South Downs with vineyards. We're already making some of the best wine, not only in Britain, but in Europe. Our sparkling wine is as good as any French champagne. And in the west of the country and the north of the country, the livestock will grow uh, even faster. But in Africa, the climate change is having a much more severe effect. On the left, we've got a reduction in growing period. I was in uh, Ghana not so long ago. 
And the rains had come a month late and finished a month early. They only had a hundred days in which to get a crop of rice in there, which was very difficult indeed. And heat is important. Every degree above 30 degrees centigrade means you get a loss of maize yield. And that's already happening, particularly at the moment in southern Africa. These are severe problems. They're much worse than the problems that we will face here in Britain. But we also are getting extreme events. And again, we're getting these extreme events in Britain. On the left was the winter of 2010, 2011, where the whole of the United Kingdom was covered in ice. That's the image from above. And as we all know, we've had massive floods here in Britain in, in December. Uh, there's the Tadcaster Bridge that was eventually destroyed by the floods. It's been there for 350 years. But the floods this year, which were the worst ever, ironically, of course, the last floods we had, which were only a few years ago, were thought to be one in a million, an unexpected event, and we've got it again. That's what's happening. We're getting extreme events more frequently and more severely. This is the 2010-2011 series of events. Great heat wave in Russia. Massive rainfall and flooding in Pakistan. If you remember, there was a great drought in the United States. And there was flooding in China. And there was a great drought in Australia. All those events coming together, and we're going to see more of that. We're going to see more of these extreme events all happening at the same time. So that's one of the challenges we face if we're going to feed the world. Another is population growth. You can see on the left, the population is growing, but it's about to plateau. We'll get another couple of billion people, but that'll be more or less it. It's still growing very rapidly in Africa. There's no sign of any plateau there. East and West Africa are growing very, very fast. So population is a challenge, and most people in the world think that that's the biggest challenge we face. I don't think it is. The biggest challenge to food security is this. The fact that many countries, in particular the emerging countries, in quotes, China, Korea, uh, India, Brazil, Nigeria, and so on, are shifting to more livestock-based diets. They're consuming more cheese and milk and eggs and yogurts and pork and lamb, and beef. The green bar is the consumption of pork and pig meat in the world. Half of that is consumed by China. China consumes half of all the pork and pig meat in the world. And of course, if you produce livestock products, you have to feed them grain and soybean. I mean, very crudely, you need about a ton of, uh, of uh, grain to produce, uh, uh, sorry, you need seven or eight tons of grain to produce one ton of meat. Seven or eight kilos of grain to produce one kilo of meat. So you've got to produce all that extra grain to feed the livestock that this burgeoning middle class in the world is consuming. So it's not surprising that the Chinese have purchased the largest pig producer and processor in the United States, actually called Smithfield. The biggest company involved in pork production in the United States is now in Chinese hands. And the Chinese import huge amounts of soybean. And of course, when we get this next big crisis, when all these extreme events come together, then the question is, there's going to be a, who's going to get the soybean and the grain, which country is going to 
be able to get that on the open market. Another problem, in many ways, the biggest scandal there is, is child malnutrition. One in three children under the age of five are malnourished. 40% of African children under five are malnourished. It means they don't get the micronutrients they need. They don't get the vitamin A, they don't get the zinc, they don't get the iron, and so on. And as a result, they grow up stunted. Stunted mentally, stunted physically. It's the biggest scandal in the world because we know what to do. The other big challenge is land degradation. We're degrading the land across the world. This is uh, results of satellite imagery done at the University of Bonn. And they show very clearly that for sub-Saharan Africa, over 25% of the land is severely degraded. Not just generally degraded, but severely degraded. And you can see the red there all along the border of the Sahel, around the Great Lakes, in uh, Eritrea up in the northeast, in Madagascar, down in Africa and elsewhere. The lo economic loss is about 68 billion a year, affecting 180 million people. Final point to mention here, before I move on, is that agriculture itself is an emitter of greenhouse gases. Something over 14% of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the world come from Afri agriculture. They're the result of carbon dioxide, but in particular the result of nitrous oxide and methane, which are much more powerful greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. And they come out of all these different activities of agriculture. OK, those are the challenges. Let's bring them down to earth. This is uh, one of my favorite ladies, except that she's actually mythological in some sense. But she's called Mrs. Namarunda, and she's in Kenya. Western Kenya, her husband's dead. She's got a sort of grown son who lives in Nairobi who sort of turns up for photo shoots and, and brings a bit of money. But you can see she's got four little children which you can only just about see because they're all hidden away there. And she's got about an eight, a hectare of land. And if she, um, if she gets a variety of maize, say, that will give her two tons per hectare, and she plants it on her land. Along come the weeds, along come the pests, along comes the drought, and she gets less than one ton. And with less than one ton, she can't feed her family. Millions of African farmers are like that. But if you find a variety that will give her three tons per hectare, you do something about the soil fertility, you do something about the pests, you do something about the weeds, you do something about the drought, and she gets two tons per hectare. She can use one ton to feed her family, and the other ton, or the other half hectare, if you like, can be used to grow a crop, bananas or coffee or whatever, for which she can get some money. And she needs money. It's very important to understand that. We tend to romanticize small farmers. They are in the business of survival, and that means they need money. They need money to send their kids to school, and they need money to buy medicines for their children. And in a sense, that's, in a nutshell, the problem that's facing all these African smallholders. 70%, or actually nearly 80%, of all the farmers in Africa are smallholders. That is, they have less than two hectares of land. That will change. There will be bigger farms. But for the time being, that's what we've got. And if Africa is to become food secure, 
It's going to be dependent upon those people, those smallholder farmers. So, what is sustainable agriculture? Well, I've just stuck up there a whole lot of phrases. And I can see you all in the audience saying, yes, that's sustainable agriculture. No, that isn't sustainable agriculture. This is sustainable agriculture, and so on. What I'm arguing is that you should be more pragmatic about this. My belief is that you have to take a place, you have to take a set of circumstances, you have to take certain people, you have to take certain cultures, you have to take desires, whatever there is that's available, and use that in a sustainable fashion to help the people in that place get a decent livelihood, which is the core phrase. So you can, you can believe, if you like, that the answer to sustainable agriculture is one of those. I'm saying it may be some mixture of those in any particular place. What we do have to do is intensify. You can see here, these are the average yields of something like maize or grain in general. In China, they're up at five tons per hectare. In southern Asia, that's India, Pakistan, they're over two and a half tons. In Africa, they're only just above one ton per hectare. When the Romans were here 2,000 years ago, we used to get one ton per hectare. I mean, we've progressed to some extent since the Romans were here. They're only getting one ton. They have to get more production to feed themselves and to feed uh, others in Africa. At the moment, Africa imports $40 billion worth of food each year. $40 billion worth. And the problem, of course, is that land and water is in short supply. We're running out of land because we're degrading it so badly. There is, of course, lots of land in the Congo along the river. And we could cut down all the trees in the Congo and plant it if we wanted to. What that would do to climate change would be horrific. We're also running short of water because of the competition for water from other sources. So actually what we have to do is to produce more, but we've got to produce more with less, and that's where the challenge comes. We have to produce more with less. It has to be sustainable at the same time. This is where we start getting to this issue of sustainability. We have to make more efficient use of inputs such as fertilizers and pesticides, like the integrated pest management I described in Borneo. We've got to reduce greenhouse gases emissions. We've got to build up natural capital. That means we have to build up the biodiversity of the rural areas. We've got to increase the capacity of, of land to absorb uh, soil moisture. We've got to increase the natural enemies, the pests. And we've got to strengthen resilience. It's a tall order. But in some ways, except particularly for a younger generation, this is exciting. This is a really big challenge, this idea of sustainable intensification. I want to give you some examples now. This is about where we're going to be going. One answer is precision farming. In the West, we now have systems. For example, this is a triangulation with a satellite where the tractor knows where it is within two to three centimeters. And it can do all kinds of things. Uh, it can determine what nitrogen and phosphorus needs to apply to the soil. It can determine if there's any weeds there. It'll come across a weed and zap it as it goes around. It'll produce here a map of the growth of the crop. Other more developed country approaches. This is a, a robocrop weeder. You can see the crop and the weeds on the left here, and you see how it's got rid of the weeds along the way. 
And Harper Adams University, which is an old agricultural college which is now uh, one of the leading agricultural universities in Britain, they're developing these robotic tractors. These robotic tractors zip around the field. You know, they kill weeds when they see them, they do this, they do that and the other, and then they come back to the farmer for their reward at the end of the day. But people say, well, that's industrial Western agriculture. That's not applicable. But the principles are. So you see here something called microdosing. This is where, when you have a hole, before you put the seed of the maize in, you put fertilizer in and manure. You put the fertilizer in using the cap of a Coca-Cola bottle or a Pepsi-Cola bottle. Any cola, it doesn't matter, the cola bottle doesn't matter to the results. <laughs> so you put that in, as he's doing it there, inside the hole. And that way you make sure you've got the fertilizer exactly where you want it. You're not spreading it all around. Drip irrigation is another example. Water going along a plastic tube with a few holes in it, exactly where you want it. Targeted fertilizers. This is in southern Ethiopia. I went to see this lady here. She'd got a new hybrid uh, maize. And in the front, she was applying something called diammonium phosphate, which is a sort of general purpose uh, fertilizer. But at the back, she was applying a the appropriate mixture of NPK, of nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus, for that land, is applying that and uh, added boron, which was deficient, and she was getting uh, five, six tons per hectare, which is really the European average. You can use ecological approaches, you can use genetic approaches, you could use socioeconomic approaches. Ecological approaches, where you use ecological principles to determine which way you're going. This is conservation farming, a very good example, where you don't plough the soil, you leave the remains of the crop on top and plant the, crop, the new crop in there. And in that way, you don't destroy the soil so much as when you're ploughing. Here's an example in Britain. You can see here they've grown wheat. He's cut down the wheat and laid it down, and now he's growing beans in the stubble of the wheat. And this is in uh, Illinois. Uh, Howard Buffett is a great experimental farmer, 5,000 acres. He's growing maize, and in the stubble he's planting this next soybean, but he's planting in between either triticale or some kind of vetch to improve the nitrogen in the soil. Another example is this wonderful tree called Phytherbia. It's a leguminous tree which sheds its leaves in the wet se season. All other trees tend to put on their leaves in the wet season. Because it's leguminous, it sheds its trees and you can grow maize underneath and get three tons per hectare without any fertilizer. And it also puts carbon back in the soil. It puts two to four tons of carbon each year, and the standing crop of trees is 10 to 20 tons of carbon. So it's doing a good job of sustainable intensification. There's also genetic intensification, in particular using hybrids. At the top there is a cross between the African rice species and the Asian rice species. And that cross produces wonderful new rice, and most Asians who look at that top right-hand picture say, what are those Africans doing in an Asian rice field? And it's not an Asian rice field, it's a rice field in Uganda. And down at the bottom here are the great hybrid rices from China. They're working this year on getting hybrid rices that produce 20 tons per hectare. And here you can see breeding for uh, Nutrients and for disease, orange flesh sweet potatoes, uh, conventional breeding, getting vitamin A into the sweet potato. Working very well in Mozambique and Uganda. On the right there, golden rice, which is genetically modified rice, uh, which is now being 
field trialled in Bangladesh, gets vitamin A into baby's feed. And the bottom here would probably be the first uh, release of a GM crop in the United Kingdom, which will be potatoes for blight resistance. Blight, of course, was the crop that caused, well, one of the crops that caused the, America, uh, the Irish famine. And here, just to give you one example of a GM crop, in this case against a wilt disease, a terrible wilt disease in Uganda, you can see what it looks like when it's damaged, what is interesting about this is it's entirely government funded. This isn't Monsanto, this isn't anybody like that. This is money from the British government, from the American government, and from the Uganda government with a gene that's been donated by Academia Sinica. So you have here a, uh, a good example of biotechnology in that way. And then finally you've got socioeconomic intensification where people come together to grow crops and to market crops. They create cooperatives. And note, they use mobile phones. The Africans have been extraordinarily inventive using mobile phones. They've created mobile banking. And I just want to do one little ad here. This is a new book that's just come out, uh, available today, to be honest. Uh, and it's called... Uh, uh, African Farmers in the Digital Age and I'm one of the editors and Kofi Annan and Sam Dryden and if you go on gatesnotes.com by this evening you should be able to uh, download that book. I've got a copy here which I'll wave to you in a moment. A great deal of the digital technology is to reduce isolation is to give people better contacts with markets, both input markets and output markets. Input markets where you can get seed and fertilizer and so on. Uh, top left, my grandfather. He used to run a co-op in Kent. He went round the farms selling seeds and fertilizer. On the right here, this lady is his sort of descendant in some way. She runs a little shop in a village and she sells seed and fertilizer. And lots, there's thousands of those shops now in the last few years all over Africa providing seed and fertilizer. And at the other end, you have to link people into the value chains. Farmers have got to be linked into value chains that go all the way from research and development to urban livelihoods. There are all kinds of issues about value chains. It's one of the most fascinating research topics there are now. Uh, one issue, of course, is who gets the value in a value chain. Ideally, it ought to be the farmer, and it ought to be the big supermarket that, it, that uh, assumes the risk, but often it's the other way around. It's the farmer who carries the risk, and the supermarket gets the value. All kinds of other issues about food processing, about youth, about insurance, and I'll do that very fast. This is one of the major opportunities for women in the value change, and that is in food processing. A very early kind of food processing is producing snacks for sale, using soybean or maize or something, and that's a little plant there, all with women producing snacks. The other issue, of course, is about youth. How are youth going to be employed in the future? This is another example. Youth by and large, like machines. And in this case, these are some young lads in Kampala, in Uganda, who've learned how to build a cob shelling machine for maize cobs. And they've produced these machines, they sell them, they lease them, they rent them, they take them around the villages and help villagers do it. That's an opportunity that can be built upon into the future. And then finally, there's the issue of insurance. And there's some work we're doing here with Eric Chavez uh, on how do you build insurance into these value chains. In the UK, we lose £6 billion a year because farmers can't 
provide what they've committed themselves to provide to the supermarkets. Because of weather. And what Eric's uh, mathematical construct does is to give you the probability of extreme weather events over a decade or two. And he can do it on a 10 kilometer square pixel. And we're helping the World Food Program now uh, in Tanzania with a new program of support to farmers. The theory here, if it works, is that when you've got insurance, farmers are more likely to invest in terms of seed and fertilizers and so on. Finally, we've got to talk about resilience. This lady is in the Sundarbans of India. Uh, they extend from India across to Bangladesh, there are low-lying islands. She's got rice field. But she's also growing root crops of various kinds, which she can sell in the village. She has a husband, and on the left, he's producing fish fry, which he can sell. On the right, he's got a little kind of bicycle taxi, if you like. He rides around the village and he gives people lifts, so he takes bags of this or that to somewhere else. So she's got rice, she's got food crops, she's got uh, income from the fish, income from the taxi. And I was walking out through the, from the village, past her house, I looked up and there was a solar panel on the roof. And one of the things you learn to do in villages is to ask damn fool questions. Because that's how you find out what's going on. And so I said, I said to her, um, why have you got a solar panel? And she sort of looked at me, you know, electricity. She didn't say electricity dummy, <coughs> but you could tell that that's what she was about to say. And I said, oh, and why do you want electricity? And she sort of, I said, light bulbs, she says. Oh, I said. And why do you want light bulbs? So the children do their homework. And if they do their homework and they get a decent education in a village school, they can get a job in the town, and when they get a job in the town, they can help to support us. And so when the next cyclone comes, which it did, they've got some basis for survival. There's a general lesson in this. It's not just about the Sundarbans of India. It's about everywhere, and it's about all of us in this room. Uh, I want to stop now. Um, I just want to say we've got these various publications. You can go on Ag for Impact, and you can download these publications. Uh, I'm delighted that you're here. I, the thing I was promised I would mention at the beginning is that the... Uh, the Institute for Food and Nutrition Systems is being created here as we speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gordon. Gordon has kindly degree, agreed to take um, some questions. Uh, we have roving microphones, and if we could have the lights up a little bit so that I can see. There's somebody over there. There's a question down here, center aisle just on the right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Tuck, and I am a force for good. That is a force for good.co, launching on the 7th of April 2016 with a shift in the new moon. My friend's grandfather owns Thailand's largest private company, it's one of the world's largest conglomerates. They have three core businesses, food, retail, and distribution. They have investments in over 20 countries, which is hiding under nine subsidiaries. Trash fish, prawn slavery, my country, smuggles in slaves from neighboring countries on boats, force feeds them amphetamines to produce this thing called trash fish. That is the fish meal for prawns, pork, chicken, 
and also now used as fertilizers. So vegetables aren't even vegetarian anymore. I can have a 15-minute conversation with this man whenever I want. And I have a million pounds, but they have $46.5 billion in one year. That was their revenue in 2013. If I had 15 minutes with this man, what do you want me to say? Thank you. Well, you're absolutely right about what's happening in Thailand. Uh, it's appalling what's going on. Thailand's the only country in the world where you can kill a cop and get away with it. That was Red Bull's son. Thank you. Uh, I think there may be ways of producing those products in a more sustainable fashion. And I think what's needed is to look at those various value chains much more carefully and to find ways of making it more sustainable. But in the end, it's a function of governance. It's a function of having countries that have got strict rules about what you can and cannot do. And that's really the most important challenge that faces countries no like China. Yeah. So what do you recommend we could replace trash fish with? The fish unfit for human eating that is made by slaves. Thank you. What, what do you think we can replace trash fish with? Well, you can, you can replace them with, with, partly with more deep, deep sea fish where there are numbers there. Because trash fish feeds the pork, chicken and prawns. No, no, and I it's understand. the cheapest, sadly it is the cheapest. I, I don't think there's a simple answer to what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question, uh, uh, second row here, near the front. Second row. Here. My name is Stefan Katsikas. Thank you very much for this lecture. Many things were very impressive, including the role of women in your, in your description. You also mentioned, and, uh, and, and, and I'm very interested in that, the potential role of genetic modification, which is a right. very sensitive emotional issue. How do you see the future and the way to address whether we can use it and in what circumstances? Well, let me first of all say that I think that Africa is going to achieve food security uh, by conventional means without genetic modification. The role of genetic modification in Africa is going to be largely confined to some of the terrible diseases. I mean, I think people don't quite realize just how awful the diseases of crops are in Africa. You can wake up in the morning and see your crop completely dis destroyed. So I think there's going to be a role for them. I think we're progressing slowly and carefully with introducing GM crops in various places. It's taking a long time, but that's probably what it has to do. And I think we'll get to a, a general agreement that they are going to be safe as we go forward because of all these trials that are going on. Hello, uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, I'd like to know, because um, you also mentioned ecological approaches, but also precision farming, uh, less fertilizer, but still fertilizer, which is uh, chemically produced. Um, so for a true paradigm shift and to coming to sustainable agriculture, wouldn't you agree to go away from all chemical fertilizers and trying to uh, have like vermicomposting, uh, different uh, sustainable, modes of, uh, of production that uh, bring us to a really sustainable mode of production and a new paradigm? I think you can eventually get there. But the problem you've got in Africa right now is that land is so degraded, your crops are so small, you've got no compost or material to put on the soil. You can't produce mulches on the soil. You know, if, you, if you've only got a, a crop of maize that produces one ton per hectare, it's going to be about that size. It's going to have hardly any leaves or stalks on it. So you're going to have to use inorganic fertilizer to get the yields up. Now, eventually, as you get the yields up, as you use more nitrogen-producing uh, crops, you can start to build up the natural soil fertility. You can mulch and compost, but it'll take... It'll take, uh, in many places, it'll take 10 years or more before you get there. 
But wouldn't you also agree that from the urban settings or from the settings where villages are, we do have a good supply of, uh, of uh, organic matter, urban waste management, and so yes. forth, that could be integrated into if that. You, if, you, if you focus on the peri-urban agriculture, exactly. which is the production of the perishable uh, goods, vegetables, tomatoes, and so on, and of pork and poultry and so on, you can use urban waste. You have to be very careful about it, though, if you start feeding urban waste to pigs and poultry, because what you'll get is massive disease. Hi, thanks a lot, that was very interesting. Um, I was just wondering about taking GM crops forward into the future and sort of overcoming some of the, op the great opposition to it, especially from within the environmental movement, if you just had any thoughts on that. Well, uh, the, the problem is talking about GM, we could talk about it for hours into the future. I mean, there's lots of issues around GM. There are issues about health, there are issues about the impact on the environment, the issue is about corporate control, uh, and many people simply don't like GM because of Monsanto. They think Monsanto is taking over the world and this is how it's doing it, and so on and so forth. So you've got to get through all of those issues before you can go forward. That's why I showed that example of a GM crop in Uganda, which is pr completely produced by uh, government funding, not by the private sector. But you've got to work those things through. Hi. First of all, thanks for coming. Really interesting lecture. Um, the question I had was about decentralizing uh, food sources. Um, there was a report from the UN a few years ago where they said one of the most likely ways we'd be able to feed the world by 2050 was if we had uh, small scale communities feeding themselves. And I was just wondering if you'd encountered anything like that, particularly in Africa, and also if you'd had any experience with the Ubuntu movement in Africa as well. The which movement? The Ubuntu movement? Don't think I know that. Okay. Um, well, there is a role for local production. I mean, I live in Sussex and we get uh, all our meat from the local farms, get our eggs from the local farms, and so on and so forth. If you live in the middle of Mumbai or Lagos or wherever, uh, you're not going to get it locally. You're going to have to import from a distance. What I think we have to do is to make sure that our cities have got peri-urban agriculture, small-scale agriculture that's very intensive, that produces very high-quality perishable goods. And then you've got further out, you've got the basics of grain being produced. So you've got a, a kind of three-level uh, production system. And I think that's then possible. Okay. Thank you for your time, sir. Hello, um, I'm a dietitian who, and I've worked in, um, in many refugee camps in the Middle East. And my question, and of course, a lot of the, the, the cases we see are <coughs> malnutrition. Um, we did see a lot of coping mechanisms, um, including farming, um, sporadic kind of farming. And I was wondering if, if from your experience, you think, um, that some of the practices that you mentioned could be applied and could be part of the solution to malnutrition in, in situations, refugee yeah, camp the, situations? The issue of, of feeding children is, is quite complicated. You, basically, when a woman is, is pregnant and when she's lactating, she needs certain kinds of foods. But in particular, the baby, both in the womb and afterwards, for a, a total of two years altogether, needs a particular mixture of carbohydrate, of protein, and of these micronutrients. And that, ha that is determined by medical people. That's what's needed, and you provide that, exactly that kind of food. But then beyond that, children need a much more diverse diet, which they can get maybe through school feeding programs. And so you then start to feed children at that age a variety of food. And that's an agricultural problem, if you like. 
So you need agriculture to produce particularly the kinds of foods that mothers eat and to produce the foods that children eat, particularly children at school. But for that first, what they call the first thousand days of a child's life, you need something really quite specific for them. It's over here. Thank you. Maggie Dalman from Imperial College. Um, wonderful talk. Thank you so much for, for coming to talk to us today. I wondered if you could comment about, um, in particular, the huge waste of food in the West yeah. and how that yeah. could contribute. Well, there's, there's two aspects to waste. The first is the waste in the villages. Effectively, what happens in most villages in Africa and elsewhere is that people store their waste in what are traditional stores in their houses and elsewhere. And very soon, those stores become full of insects and rats and everything else, and very little grain is left in there. It's a big waste. And one way to get round that, which we've seen in Uganda, is that the grain goes to a warehouse immediately it's been harvested. And it's kept in that warehouse, and it's, but it's still owned by the farmers. And then at some point somebody comes along, the World Food Programme for example, when we were there, comes along and buys the grain and they have to do a deal with the farmers as to how much they're going to pay for it. So it's a quite transparent system. They have to pay for the storage, but that's where it comes through. And they can fumigate the grain so they can get rid of the waste. And that really reduces waste enormously. Now that's not the problem we have in the developed countries. In the developed countries, our waste comes about because we don't eat everything. We leave a lot on the plate. I hope nobody's going to leave anything on their plate tonight who's coming to the dinner. But we also, of course, have uh, sell-by dates on everything. And you're not allowed to sell something when it's beyond its sell-by date. Uh, for very good reasons. And the question is, what do you do with that? Now, what we used to do, of course, is feed it to pigs. And that was the cause of the big foot and mouth outbreak. So we now don't do that anymore. So we've really got a really big problem with all that food that we waste in the supermarket and elsewhere. Some of it can be given away, but basically a lot of it just simply goes into some kind of composting or landfill or something of that nature. The other problem you've got is that if you reduce the waste in the developed countries, how do you ensure that actually benefits developing countries? You can't just sort of load it all up and ship it off free because if you, if you provide free food within a country, then the farmers are destroyed and, and, and the whole system collapses. So you've got to find ways of channeling it. You can do it through the World Food Programme. And I think one of the biggest benefits of reducing waste will be to produce more food for the World Food Programme. World Food Programme, of course, as you know, has been feeding in Syria and... Uh, uh, several times in the, in the last couple of years, they've run out of money to provide the uh, grain that's needed in Syria. So that's a way in which you can begin to recirculate it. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry, there couldn't be some disappointed people, but we're going to have to have one last question. I think Gordon is going to be outside of the great reception, so if you're lucky, you may be able to ask a question afterwards. Hi, first of all, thank you so much for your um, talk. It was really um, inspirational. <clears throat> so let's say far away in the future, Africa becomes food secure, and Africa becomes economically secure, and it becomes a, and it becomes a continent full of industrialized nations that all want to eat meat, and it just exacerbates this huge problem that we have of meat consumption. What can we do to change attitudes towards yeah. eating meat in the developed world once the rest of the world catches up? It's a very good question, that. Uh, and it's not a simple answer to it. I mean, well, the simple answer is we should all become vegetarian. The likelihood of that happening is very small. We, uh, I, I gave a lecture like this in China, the China Agricultural University. 
and um, audience about this size, and I said, how many of you are vegetarians? And two ladies in the front put their hands up, and they were both Americans. <laughs> Not a single Chinese person put their hand up. I think there are two ways we're going to do this. One is that we're going to shift so that we don't eat as much meat. In other words, we shift, um, I think the, the former governor of California, I can never remember which one it was, Schwarzenegger or somebody, said we ought to only have uh, meat, uh, or she would have two meat-free days a week, or something of that nature. And I think that would be good. I think we could do that. And it would begin to have some kind of impact. If you ask Bill Gates this issue, question, he says, the future lies in what he calls faux meat, F-A-U-X, meat. In other words, meat that looks like meat but isn't. It's made from vegetable material. And the Chinese and the Thais are producing those. I mean, you can buy, in Thailand, you can buy a, a, a prawn uh, that looks like a prawn, walks like a prawn, dances like a prawn, but isn't a prawn, it's just soybean. And I think that is going to make a difference. You can get some really high quality pretend meats now, and I think those will be one way in which we'll cut down on our meat consumption. But we're going to have to do that. Thank you. To, to finish, I'd like to invite my colleague, Professor Tom Welton, Dean of the Faculty of Sciences, to come up to the stage and propose a vote of thanks. Tom. So, of course, the purpose of a vote of thanks is to say thank you. So, thank you, Gordon. Good. Um, but particularly, I'd like to say thank you for giving such, as somebody said, an inspiring lecture that wasn't a call of despair, it was a call to action. And I think that particularly the students in the room should be thinking about how they can think of their futures, their research, and how they can affect change in areas as important as this. But we're already doing this kind of stuff. Um, in the college and in the Faculty of Natural Sciences. We have uh, people like Gaddy Frankel in Life Sciences, who's working on uh, food safety. Uh, Peter Torok in Physics, who's working on the physics of food production and how that can be made more effective. We have people like uh, Colin Prentice, um, who is one of your colleagues, who's working on supply chain management. And particularly, uh, we have the people from the Agritech Network, who you can meet outside, or rather downstairs, um, after the lecture, and I'd like to tell you about a few of them. Um, and particularly, I'd like to, to note Kerry O'Donnelly and Angela de Manazos, um, who were founders of an uh, amazing uh, startup idea called Fungi Alert. And it's a, a technology to uh, be able to uh, uh, diagnose soil health and crop health remotely um, on farms. We've got students from the uh, Next Gen AgriChem. Uh, doctoral program who have uh, been working with Syngenta and they'll present their work, their work through some interactive uh, displays and some artwork and posters. And we've also got representatives from the BBSRT um, and EPSRT funded Agriscience Chemical Biology Network, Agrinet. And so with that, thank you also to you for coming and attending. Thank you for your interesting contributions. And it's now time to go downstairs and have a drink and mix with each other. So have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's the digital book which you ought to be able to download from Gates Notes if he's done it by this evening. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's definitely the